Amen. So I'm just going to give you a couple of um, verses that may not look like they apply, but I, I'll, I have a reason for doing this. Um, again, around what I just said, this idea that, of being sensitive. I don't think it's a coincidence that Harvey Weinstein went to jail this week, right? That's been in the press for a long time. And that problem has been going on for thousands of years, really. People abusing their power. I don't mean to pick on him. He's one of hundreds that have resigned from their positions, but he turned into kind of a, a representative of what the problem was, people abusing power. God hates that. Over and over in the word, you see, he hates injustice. Um, we're told that we are to defend the helpless, right? For people who can't protect themselves, we are to stand in the gap. It's what Jesus does. But there's an, un, I think, a misunderstood verse. The, the quote on the top of the next slide, it says, is actually from Simon and Garfunkel, believe it or not. It says, blessed are the sat upon, spat upon, and ratted on. All right? That doesn't sound like a Bible verse, but it actually is taken from Matthew 5, verse 3, which is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's the beginning of the Beatitudes. And it's not, not well understood, I'm sorry to say. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And Matthew of the four Gospels uses the word kingdom of heaven more than, well, he never uses kingdom of God. The other Gospels say kingdom of God. And unfortunately, because of our connotation of what heaven means, this verse is often taken to mean blessed are they who are poor in spirit because when they die and they go to heaven, they won't be poor anymore. They're mourning now, but when they die and go to heaven, because he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, right? So that means when you die and you go to heaven, then you won't be mourning anymore and you'll be comforted. That's not what Jesus meant, okay? This is a very present help in time of trouble. You don't have to wait until you die to be comforted, comforted in your mourning. And being poor in spirit can cover a whole range of things. You could get a call tonight from somebody unexpected telling you of an emergency in your family and go from being on the mountaintop to having a, a really tough experience. Now, it wouldn't be very kind of God to say, yeah, don't worry, when you die and you come to heaven, everything will be fine. No, you have resources available to you now that you can pull from, which is the kingdom of God that's available to you. And if you just do a word study on that little phrase, kingdom of God, and, and substitute kingdom of God for kingdom of heaven in the gospel of Matthew, uh, that will really uh, produce a good harvest for you of, of revelation. The, the uh, Passion Translation takes that same verse and says, what wealth is offered to you when you feel your spiritual poverty? Very different, isn't it? It's, it's a different way of looking at it than just blessed are the poor in spirit. This is saying, no, when you feel your spiritual poverty, Cindy did. She described it multiple different ways in, in her testimony that she knew she was not where God would want her to be, but she didn't know how to get out of that. But he's saying, here, you're blessed when you feel that because there's, a, there's no charge to enter the realm of heaven's kingdom. All those resources that God has available to us are accessible through the body of Christ, through the word of God, through Holy Spirit, and like she said, by being loved. You know, that's the most amazing gift of the body of Christ is that we can love people when they're hurting and not put a condition on it and say, well, you go get cleaned up first. And when, when you meet the standard, then we'll love you. That's not how Jesus did it for us, is it? So it's not how we do it for each other. So I'm going to compare it to Mother Teresa for a minute because we, I know she worked with the uh, literally poor people of Calcutta, but there are a lot of carryover concepts where we're dealing with the poor because if you're broken through a trauma, uh, it could be a veteran coming back from Afghanistan who, who's post-traumatic stress from being in combat or Vietnam veterans. It's very similar. The way the enemy works on people's lives is he just tries to destroy us in our emotions. And, and Mother Teresa was not a highly qualified person when it came from an education standpoint or she didn't come from a family of means. <laughs> she just had a very high level of the love of Jesus. And this is what Malcolm Muggeridge said. I'll tell you who he is in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. He wrote a book called Something Beautiful for, for God About Her. What the poor need, Mother Teresa is fond of saying, even more than food and clothing and shelter, though they need these too, desperately, is to be what? Yeah. Is to be wanted. It's the outcast state their poverty imposes upon them that is the most agonizing. 
It's not feeling connected to other people. If they were lepers, they had to stay in the leper colony. Many of these people that she dealt with in Calcutta were former professional people. They were doctors and lawyers and had been very successful but had contracted uh, leprosy and now were living destitute lives. And in, in some ways it's worse when you've lived in wealth and then had it taken away by a disease than if you never knew it. And again, it's just the way the devil tries to wreak havoc on people. So what she found out is just helping them feel like they still have value, that every life has a tangible value to God, and we're his representatives, so we're going to show you that you have tangible value, is more important than the food in the shelter. She had a place in her heart for all of them. To her, they're all children of God, for whom Christ died, and so deserving of all love. If God counts the hairs of each of their heads, if none are excluded from the salvation the crucifixion offers, then who would venture to exclude them from earthly blessings and esteem? Who will pronounce one life unnecessary, that one life is better terminated, now she's talking about abortion, or never begun? Similar story from a historian that talked about how Christianity became as big as it has become. Because if you looked at the odds historically, there's no reason Christianity ever should have made it out of you know, uh, Israel. You know, there, there, there was nothing going for it <laughs> in the natural. But we know Holy Spirit, the Word of God. We know why, but the, the world looks at it and say, man, how did this thing, this belief system that we all count on now, how did it become so popular? And here's a commentary. It says, one of the most striking passages in Rodney Stark's remarkable book, The Rise of Christianity, is his description of how Christians in ancient Turkey would react when their town was struck by plague. Okay? The rich and the well-to-do, particularly doctors, would gather up their family and their possessions and leave town. So the doctors left. They'd flee to the hills to fresher, less polluted air or to friends or family in town some distance away. But the Christians, often among the poorest, and many of them slaves, would stay and nurse the people, including those who were neither Christians nor their own family members nor in any other way connected to them. Sometimes such people got well again because not all the diseases were fatal. Sometimes Christians would themselves catch the disease and die from it. But the point was made graphically and unmistakably. This was a different way to be human. Mother Teresa showed a different way to be human. She plunged into the ghetto of Calcutta. I don't know how much you know about her story, but they told her she couldn't do it. They told her she had to stay uh, in the home that they had in Calcutta behind this beautiful, it was a donated estate of a wealthy family had donated to the Catholic Church. And she had to appeal all the way up to the Pope to, to get approval to go out and start her, her ministry in the in the ghetto, and it's a, it's a wonderful story. I won't go into it too much, but uh, where there's a will, right? When, when you have a vision, God will make a way. So back to Malcolm Mug Muggeridge with Mother Teresa. He said, I ran away from Calcutta and stayed away. He was a British guy that was working for BBC, and he was there on assignment in the 1930s, and he just could not take the poverty. He, it was too big of a, a culture shock from what he was used to, and Cambridge, and you know, he was, he was a highly educated guy. He said, I ran away from Calcutta and stayed away. Mother Teresa moved in and stayed. That was the difference. A nun, slightly built, a few rupees in her pocket, not particularly clever or particularly gifted in the arts of persuasion, just with this Christian love shining about her in her heart and on her lips, prepared to follow her Lord, and in accordance with his instruction, regard every derelict left to die in the streets as Jesus. Wow. <laughs> so why does this matter in a class about trying to heal people, right? It's sexual abuse, yes, that's a very difficult thing to be healed from, but all emotional trauma is difficult to be healed from, right? This is a big part of what it takes. People that are sold out to Jesus, that are willing to work with whoever, in whatever situation, and never say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, that's above my pay grade. She had an eighth grade education. <laughs> there was a lot of things above her pay grade. All she did was love up on people. The mission in Calcutta was 
we want to help people have a dignified death. She said they had two eyes, two loving eyes looking into them when they were born, and we want to give them two loving eyes looking in when they die because they were just dying on the street. So she would go around with water and just, she shouldn't have medicine or anything. They had no money. They were begging on the street, but, but they had the love of Christ. And a lot of the people that they ended up saving weren't dying of any terminal illness. They were dehydrated. All they needed was water. And then, you know, just to finish that, you know, she was prepared to follow her Lord and in accordance with his instruction regard every derelict left to die in the streets as him. To hear in the cry of every abandoned child, even in the tiny squeak of a discarded fetus, and they saved many babies that were just discarded, uh, you know, right at, just, just born and left on the streets. She would hear in them the cry of the Bethlehem child and to recognize in every leper's stumps the hands which once touched sightless eyes and made them see, the hands that rested on distracted heads and made them calm, and the hands that brought back health to sick flesh and twisted limbs. So even when she looked at the leper stumps, she could see the hands of Jesus because that leper was made in his image. And we are the body of Christ. So we act on his behalf in the earth with love. And even when we don't know what to do, even when we don't know what to say, we can say, blessed are the sat upon, spat upon, and ratted on. <laughs> because the world will laugh at that. They don't have anything going for them. You know what? They have Jesus. They have an advocate. They have somebody that's willing to love them. I'm going to just go through some of the characteristics. If you want to look on the handout that I gave you, you'll see some of these notes now. And this is, um, I think, about halfway down the page, there's a list that says characteristics of women who were victims of childhood sexual trauma. And notice it said childhood sexual trauma. And I know many people are, are traumatized later in life as well, but this is one of the expertise, uh, one of the areas of expertise, excuse me, that the Sanfords had. Uh, all areas of sexual abuse, but it's particularly damaging when it happens to children. So here are some of the results. Recurrent and intrusive recollections, dreams, or reliving of experiences. That would be true of a lot of different forms of trauma. Um, I, did anybody here see the movie Sully? That was done by Clint Eastwood. Uh, he would have imaginary scenes come into his mind as he was looking out the uh, window in skyscraper. But he thought a real plane was coming in and crashing into the buildings. They did a, an amazing job of, of you know, recreating that, or what that would have looked like. And, and, and these are just kind of scenes that appear in people's minds that are intrusive recollections, dreams, or reliving, actually feeling what you were feeling. Generalized anxiety and mistrust and social isolation, Cindy talked about that. Difficulty forming or maintaining, it says intimate relationships, and it says a non-exploitive intimate relationship. So Cindy described how she ended up marrying somebody who was abusive. Because any kind of gating that she would have had to, to learn how to stop that was violated. So she didn't have the ability to, to easily gauge if somebody was going to be abusive. Sexual dysfunction, chronic depression, we heard her say self-blame, I blamed myself for this, is a common thing that you hear, and poor self-esteem. So here we are, let's just bring ourselves in, into a Sunday service, and we go upstairs for, for fellowship, there's coffee, there's food out, people are just sitting around talking, and you see somebody sitting off by themselves in a corner. Do we feel the, the green light from Holy Spirit sometimes to just sit down and start a conversation? And not be too dozy, you know, not be overly enthusiastic, but appropriate to the scene. Meet them where they're at. Ask the Lord, is there anything I could say to this person to get to know them better? We hope people will always feel comfortable coming here for that reason. I'm so grateful for what Cindy said, that this is a safe place and that there's not going to be a screening process before you can come to this church. If you're breathing, you can come. If you're dangerous to other people, we have to be careful, right? We, we have to keep it safe for people. But if you're hurting, we want you to find the medicine that you need through the Lord. They also suffer from acute anxiety or depression. 
And it says secondary to symbolically important life changes or anniversaries. So they come through Christmas, and now all of a sudden they go into an acute anxiety or depression. Could be for a lot of reasons, but one would be that they don't have the same experiences. Cindy said it about feeling arrested development, that the other kids her age were getting a certain level of toys and, or whatever gifts, and she wasn't. And you're constantly being reminded that you're not fitting in with the other people that are with you. Acute anxiety or depression. The next one says dissociative features. All right, so a disconnecting. Part of that same post-traumatic stress syndrome issue is I'm, I'm physically present, but I'm not always completely emotionally present. Diminished self-protection, masochistic strivings, and repeated victimization. Now, I know these are kind of clinical terms, but I just wanted to show you what a long list of things that happen to people, and, and this is all documented through, unfortunately, just thousands of cases that happen every year, just in our culture. And we have a relatively safe culture compared to other places in the world. But this is a plague of the devil, sexual violation. Um, and then I, identity focused on a sense of badness and stigmatization, feeling dirty. Contempt for women, including themselves. Tendency to fear men and yet overvalue and idealize them as well. Tumultuous adolescence, early pregnancy, running away, or substance abuse. Um, I'm almost done. I, I know it's a long list, but passivity and unassertiveness would be just that disconnecting part. I don't feel like I can uh, compete with the other people at my level because of this arrested development that I felt. A history of promiscuity or prostitution. Impulsive or self-injurious behavior, suicide attempts, self-utilization, substance abuse, chronic post-traumatic stress disorder, inappropriate guilt and underlying resentment, and then the issue of this intergenerational transmission. That's a big word, but you can understand that hurt people hurt people. So people who have been abused could be more likely than others to abuse their own children or, as Cindy pointed out, marry somebody who does she didn't say he abused children, but was a sexually abusive person. Defection from the family's religion and a history of childhood learning problems. Now, I didn't want you to be depressed after reading that list. I'm just trying to give you the scope of how demonic this whole thing is and how deeply it impacts people and how much we have to have empathy and care and prayer for them. Nothing's too hard for God. This is the song, I sang this song based on this portion of scripture here, Jeremiah 29 in the Amplified, verse 10, this is the Lord speaking, it says, I will visit you and keep my good promise to you, causing you to return to this place, meaning back to Jerusalem. They were in exile when this was written. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Do you believe that? Are they good thoughts? But if, you're, if you've been scrambled through sexual abuse, it's hard for you to believe that. Cindy talked about being angry at God. We're going to talk about that here when we get to Joyce Meyer's testimony as well. I'm going to say it again. Verse 11, I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil. To give you hope in your final outcome. Then you will call upon me, and you will come and pray to me, and I will hear and heed you. Then you will seek me, inquire for, and require me as a vital necessity. Do you understand what he's saying here? That we're not going to want to live without God. He's going to be a requirement on our list. We're going to require him as a vital necessity in our lives, and we'll find him when we search for him with all our heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will release you from captivity. Well, that's a good portion of scripture to memorize. This comes from Paula's uh, book on healing victims of sexual abuse. The victim may have experienced the initial molestation several years before you meet them, okay? So they've developed lots of coping mechanisms, and it's not easy for them to talk about this, and it's obviously a very sensitive subject. As a general rule, just because things are sensitive subjects doesn't mean we shouldn't discuss them, right? We should do so in a, in a trained way and in a very careful way, but to ignore them doesn't help the person. The right people should, should be doing the talking, but 
we are all can be the right people if we get the right training. Amen? So the first violation that they experience inflicts the deepest wounding and establishes a base of confusion and fear. Subsequent experiences reinforce the wounding. All right, so that means, like Cindy said, that it happened more than once, right? Those are subsequent experiences, even though the child may have learned to fantasize in order to shut them out of her consciousness. If the molestation, by the way, I just want to say, they're using females being abused. Uh, 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 they speak of a woman being abused, but much of the book is also about the, own, the story of their own son, Mark, who was sexually abused horrifically when he was five years old, and they didn't know it. Uh, so you can imagine the pain they experience as a family being counselors and having that happen to their son. Yeah, it's a powerful story in that book. I didn't have time to get to it, but I just want you to know that they're not just thinking that women are alone in this problem. If the molestation consisted only of fondling, she may have sensed in her spirit the wrongness and the uncleanness of the act, but the one who touched her was an important person. In this case, she says, daddy or some other trusted adult. So just think about the scrambling that would happen in the mind of a child, knowing that her father is supposed to be the one to be protecting her, and yet he's doing something that she might not specifically be able to tell you why it's wrong, but she knows in her spirit something's really wrong. Children, though, are trained not to say no to adults, especially their parents. She needed to be loved and affirmed he represented authority. He said everything was all right, but it didn't feel right. She struggled with conflicting emotions and began to manifest avoidance patterns. She no longer wanted to sit at his lap. She resisted his hugs, which earlier she had sought. She no longer wanted her daddy to tuck her in at night. She wanted to sleep with the door closed. If her mother worked, the girl would play at a neighbor's house until she was sure her mother had returned home. These change patterns develop gradually into more easily recognizable running patterns as she grew into adolescence. And if you remember two weeks ago when I taught the first round of this, Paula interviewed that family and she talked about the young girl, the 14-year-old girl in that family, and all of these things were true of, of that behavior pattern. Now, why would this matter for us tonight? Well, because you might have friends who are saying, gee, I just don't know what's wrong with my, my teenage daughter. She's been doing really well for all these years, and now all of a sudden she's starting to display a different pattern, you know, like really irrational behavior. Well, I mean, that's, a, that's something to pray into, that it could have been some kind of trauma that, she, trauma that she's afraid to talk about. And we have to ask the Lord to, to help us how to deal with that. Handle with care, but pray into it. And this is Paul again. I've seen a great deal of what I call crippled coping in many whom we have counseled. Some who've sought our ministry were already aware that their present problems were rooted in early experiences of molestation, but a large number have come having only the perplexing symptoms and suppressed memories which were revealed in the counseling process, okay? So that's why I want to emphasize this idea of a safe culture and why we require this training that you're going through if anybody wants to be involved in ministry in our church because it could be very likely that you'll be up here on the prayer line someday and you need to be prepared to know what to do and what to say when somebody could come with this kind of a devastating life problem. Now, there are times when we say the problem somebody's dealing with, if they're on any kind of medication or something, that, that might be more than we should be doing at this level here because we just offer biblical counseling. There's no fees or anything, but we've been doing it a long time with really good results. So for many of the people, we can make a major change in their lives, but we're not going to say that we're practicing uh, medicine without a license, right? So there are times when people need a higher level of sophistication. I don't even know that I could say permanently because if somebody's on medication, we're going to pray that they'll get sorry, healed. I didn't quite catch oh, sorry, that. Siri, sorry. <laughs> she wanted me to repeat that, I guess. Uh, we would pray that even though the, the medicine is needed right now to stabilize their situation, that they'll get healed and be able to come off it, right? So, look, we're not against doctors. You know, they, they serve a tremendous need, but Jesus is the healer, no matter what. He's the healer. <laughs> 
So they just come in and they know, I, I like this last paragraph, the way she wrote it, a large pe number of people have come, all they know is I'm having perplexing symptoms and I can't put my finger on why. I have suppressed memories and then those suppressed memories get revealed in counseling. And then it says, in our years of ministry, we've observed most of the above characteristics in counselees who experience sexual abuse as children. We've also seen that helping women to identify their hurts understand and express their feelings and develop ways of coping are only the beginning. Okay, I'm gonna read that again because it's important to realize that you don't have to beat yourself up if you don't feel like you're getting healed fast enough and whatever the thing is that we're dealing with, right? Because we've covered 15 weeks, I think we're up to 15 weeks we've been talking about. Each time we get together, there's some different issue that we're raising here, right? This is the second week for this one, but whether it's parental inversion, substitute mate, performance orientation, spiritual rebellion that Cindy talked about last week. They're all different tools the enemy uses against us, but God has the tools, the weapons, the power, Holy Spirit, truth of the word of God, renewing our mind, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We're just trying to help you realize something you might have been dealing with for a long time. You're not the only one and that there's healing available in the Lord. So that point is, we've also seen that helping women to identify the hurt, okay? So it's not just random symptoms anymore. I'm realizing that I probably went through something that I've been blocking out of my mind for a while. So, okay, I'm in touch with something bad probably happened to me. Identify the hurt, understand and express what they're feeling. Cindy did a great job of talking about how she didn't want to express how she was feeling. It was hard to even cry. And that was a win to be able to cry again. Many of us wouldn't be able to relate to that. But that's a victory. That's, that's progress. But it's only the beginning of healing. Fullness of healing is accomplished one way, Paula Sanford says, by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens is we have to invite him in through prayer to enable forgiveness. We're going to talk about forgiveness a lot tonight. To transform the inner man or woman and to do the work of renewal in the mind. That's worth reading again, okay? Fullness of healing is accomplished by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as he's invited in through prayer to enable forgiveness. Prayer to enable forgiveness. That means we can't do forgiveness completely on our own. It's a supernatural ability of God. It's extremely hard. You feel like you're betraying yourself to forgive people who hurt you because you feel like you're letting them off the hook. That's not true. You're getting yourself out of the prison of bitterness, of poison, of unforgiveness in your system. And the devil just loses again when you forgive that person. Huh. And then the renewal in the mind, you know, that's Romans 12 too. And that's something that we really can be very active in our pursuit of because we renew our mind through the word of God and through avoiding watching things that are going to corrupt us and pollute our minds, right? Whether the diagnosis is made and healing is begun in childhood or many years later, no one must be consigned to live in a wounded, crippled state forever. That's really good news, okay? Nobody's beyond help. Sometimes the progress feels like it's going slowly, but then there'll be a, a rapid burst of growth. It's amazing how it works. And then in Philippians 1, 6, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, he's able to complete what he starts. Such a wounded one may continue to run, especially when love and care seem to be healing her heart. That's confusing for people that are watching the process happen. Why would the person, as they're starting to feel like healing is starting to happen, why would they want to run away from that? Paula says, when love begins to penetrate that defensive wall that was so beautifully articulated by Cindy, she had a wall to protect herself behind. When love starts to get behind that defensive wall to cause her to begin to trust, she feels vulnerable once again. And uh-oh, that's not a good place to be, to be vulnerable again. So I'm going to quit before you fire me kind of thing. I'm out of here. And, and the fear just starts to take over. She thinks the walls of her close heart and her protection, I'm sorry, are protection. She thinks those walls are protection and is frightened when love seems to be melting down those walls. So she runs, 
just when the loved ones around her think she has a chance to be whole again. For that reason, she may compulsively find fault with the people whose love begins to melt those walls. And so the watered land, oh, this is really powerful the way she writes this. The watered land, you know, the, the, the healing that started to take place is swept away with dry. She runs from it and refuses to receive that healing initially. As those who yearn to restore her, the people around her that are praying for her, that want to bring her to wholeness, they're grieving over the fact that she keeps running away and retreating. The picture is not hopeless, however. Say amen. <laughs> I don't want you to be depressed tonight. We are healed people, and Jesus can heal it all. This is what she says. We have seen countless people who've experienced similar woundings find their healing, and now they are ministering powerfully to others. You saw one up here tonight. Didn't that minister to you? Right. The body of Christ needs to understand the need for wisdom, sensitivity, patience, perseverance in ministry. Um, we've learned that, you know, over all the years that God's in control, right? It may not look like you're making a particular amount of progress here, but sometimes a wall is getting chipped down and it's being cracked, 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 and then boom, it falls. Even though the person might be look like they're fighting you, they're not. They just need to go through a process. We must learn to intercede in prayer effectively and beyond that to be there for the sake of the abused, with a quality of love and ministry which can rebuild trust. So that's what I was talking about Mother Teresa at the beginning, okay? That's what I was talking about. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. There's an availability of power, supernatural power, that not necessarily available in professional settings, okay? This is, uh, we, we talk about it often here. Sometimes the sessions will go a lot longer than we expected them to. And I'm not trying to be critical of professionals because they have an hour and you could be in the middle of the worst part of the whole hour, right at, at minute 59, and it's like, okay, see you next week. <laughs> it's a little rough. So try to time your emotions to end around 45 minutes so you can wind down a little bit. And again, I'm not meaning to be critical. It's a really hard job. I'm not meaning critical of the professionals, but this is a different mindset, a different model. It's based on biblical counsel and Holy Spirit and prophetic wisdom. All right, so um, this is what one of their friends, Amy Carmichael, is a friend of the Sanfords, said, if I don't have the patience of Christ, my Savior, with those who are not growing as quickly as I think they should be, then I know nothing of Calvary's love. Okay, so, like, come on, I've met you so many times and you're still not progressing? I don't think you want to say that to somebody, right? Like maybe I need to be hearing more clearly what the, re what the, the remedy should be as the counselor. A girl who's been sexually abused by her father is driven by many confusing factors within the tyranny of feelings which beset her. And again, I'm only telling you this because I want you to try to relate to how complicated and I, I kept talking about that verse about that God makes the crooked way straight. Well, there's few things that make you more crooked inside, that, that so confuse the wiring as sexual abuse, especially by an authority figure like a father. So she says, first she experiences confusion of identity. Her problem is much deeper and more basic than the fact that she's been forced into an involuntary, you know, this means, right, she's usurping the role of her mother. Her father's having sex with her, the father's supposed to be having sex with the mother. So now all of a sudden that whole dynamic comes into play Never mind that he shouldn't be touching me this way, as the father has related to her in ways that belong only to her mother. Her sense of who she was created to be as a female, a daughter, a wife, and mother has been battered, torn, and twisted at the root level. As a mother tenderly holds her nursing child, deep messages of being chosen and cherished are written into that infant's heart. And that's a verse in Psalm 22.9. You made, I'm sorry, thou did base me trust when upon my mother's breast, right? So the whole idea of a safe home and nurturing your children and loving them and, and holding them and letting them feel unconditionally loved gets violated when this thing happens. And on multiple levels, the identity gets scrambled. And in a healthy relationship, as bonding happens, basic belonging is established. Remember the class we did on that called Basic Trust? 
and how when there's a crack in the foundation, it's got to get dealt with. Even though you get older and you go into other stages of development, that crack stays there until you deal with it. And that's part of that arrested development that Cindy was describing. So um, not only with the mother, but with the father. So I'll just read that sentence again. It says, as that bonding happens in the childhood, especially as children nurse um, with their mothers, that there's such a connection there. It's such a profound connection that happens in that process. As that happens, basic belonging is established. That basic trust is another way of saying that. But not only with the mother, but with the father as well. From the father, the little girl needs confirmation that she's lovable and desirable as a female. If a little girl feels safe with her father, that builds into her a basic capacity to relax in the arms of her husband later. Now, this is hard. You know, when you have these classes, it's hard because people start to get angry about the way they were raised. And it seems like not enough people could say, oh, no, I had an awesome, my parents are awesome. They did everything right. Right? Not normally the case. It doesn't mean that they were abusing us, but not every father gets this picture, gets the fact of how important of a role he plays in his daughter's development. It builds into her a basic capacity to relax in the arms of her husband later. If her father treats her mother with respect and affection, she identifies herself as one who will also someday be cherished and respected by a man. If he takes time to notice and affirm his daughter, if he communicates his pride in her and tells her she's beautiful, if he spends time with her and expresses affection sensitively and cleanly, then she will know herself to be a treasure. In this way, she'll be equipped with self-esteem and confidence to present herself sexually and in every other way to her husband as a blessing and a gift. But there's the other side. A girl whose father has molested her feels not only betrayed, but an intruded upon, disrespected, used, unclean, trapped, manipulated, robbed, and trashed, okay? And I'm sure there's more adjectives she could have used. So obviously it doesn't always happen by a father, but it's, it's a really huge violation when it is. It's uh, the exact opposite role that that man is supposed to be playing. Her sense of glory, dignity, and worth have been stolen from her. She feels like a nothing, a nobody who could ever be accepted by the somebodies if they should ever happen to find out what has been done to her. Now, isn't that demonic? She had nothing to do with this, and yet she feels ashamed to let other people know what happened to her. And, um, well, I'm going to just keep going. I want to cover it the prayer at the end, and I want to get to Joyce Meyer's testimony, too, because it's really powerful. It's on your handout, but I want to walk through it. It says, therefore, she tends to gravitate towards those friends who, re who represent her lowered, crippled self-esteem. You, you track them with this? Like, since I don't want to try to compete with the somebodies, I'm going to pool together with people who don't have a very high opinion of themselves either. So I won't have to be compared to the somebodies. She clings to them as they tell her she's OK. There's nothing in these lowly people to threaten her self-image. For through wounded eyes, she sees herself in them, and she tells herself she belongs. She struggles with tremendous guilt. In almost every case of molestation, the victim feels some way responsible. I must have done something. The something she did was, in fact, only to want her daddy to notice and affirm her with wholesome attention. He failed to understand that sacred trust God had given him to protect his daughter as she blossomed into loveliness. He responded out of his own self-centered, undisciplined need for gratification. But she thinks, I still should have resisted more than I did. You can always find a reason to fault yourself. But she had been overpowered on two counts, at least, how does a child successfully resist an authority figure who's more than twice her strength? And how can a girl deal at that moment with paralyzing fear? Her sense of guilt is sometimes compounded. Oh, this one is just so demonic. Is sometimes compounded by premature sexual arousal and ambivalent feelings. God built us all to experience pleasurable sensations in sex, 
but hers have become mixed with feelings of nastiness and revulsion. She thinks something must be wrong with me. And no, that's not true. So let's look at how do we get whole, okay? This isn't in your notes, but uh, Joyce Meyer's testimony is on the back of that, so we'll get there in a minute. But just take a look at some of these points that they, that they make in their book. Again, I'm qualifying it by saying we're not against psychology per se. We believe Christian psychology, okay? So sometimes they line up with each other and sometimes they don't. And a basic way to remember that is secular psychology tries to build up self. Christian psychology says, no, Jesus wants you to die to self and live for him, okay? But there are plenty of places where they're not at odds with each other. Anyway, I'm not a psychologist, but we've studied it long enough to know. All right, so this says, while psychologists want to restore individuals to a functioning level, Christian counselors are working to forgive, but we could say to get people to forgive and to bring to death the old man and have rebirth in Christ. Now, that's an expression you hear a lot in this class. I'll use performance orientation again as an example because if you were raised in that kind of a culture, you can't fix it. It has to die. Do you remember this? Right? You don't fix it. You kill it. You bring it to the cross and you say, Jesus, I need that person who lives off of that performance orientation mindset not to be fixed. I need That needs to be crucified. And I need you to raise me to be able to work out of love, not fear. What's the fear if it's performance orientation? I'm only going to be loved if I... Well, that's a lot of pressure because we don't always perform well, do we? So that means I'm not going to always be loved unless I bring my A-plus game all the time. No. God's saying, I love you because of you, and I want you to feel comfortable with who you are, not based on how well you perform. Should you perform well? Yes. Will you perform well if you love yourself? Yes. Probably perform better than out of fear. Okay, so read it again. What are, what are we doing? We're work, working to forgive. We want to get the person to forgive the person that helped them, forgive themselves, ask for forgiveness for any ways that they've misaligned but then also bring death to the old person. And, and, and with all those symptoms that we, we listed, not one of them would be what God would have wanted for us to have, right? Anxiety, trauma, memories, low self-esteem, all the things that came as a package of that trauma. He's saying, no, there's a better life for you. I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, plans to flourish, says the Lord. So let's let that old person go. That's hard to do, isn't it? Because... I know that person. I've learned how to function as that person. I may not be hitting on all eight cylinders, but at least I'm hitting on five. <laughs> and if you tell me to take it to the junkyard, I don't know what the new car is going to look like. <laughs> Who am I going to be on the other side of the resurrection? And that takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? Because we may not like the results of it, but we got used to doing it. And that's why it's got to die. OK, so we'll keep going. For us, the counselee's difficulty, this is a really profound statement, is not only something to deplore and overcome, right? The problem that you went through, Cindy, yes, we deplore it, and you do have to overcome it, but also a blessing to appreciate as the context in which God matures a soul. That's a little bit of a difficult pill to swallow, that anything good could come from that. But because God's in it, and he, he might not have protected us from it, but he gave us the strength to get through it. That might sound weak to you, but no, because once sin came in into the garden, a war started, and now there's casualties of war. So he, can't, he could have prevented them from sinning, but then they wouldn't have had free will. Okay? I'm going to keep going here. We must look at the entire life, especially to the transformation of the nature to sin. Whenever we're not grounded in a biblical doctrine of sin, this is also really important, so try to catch it. Healing becomes problem-centered rather than cross and sanctification-centered. When the problem-centered focus is used, forgiveness and comfort can be applied without the inner structures being brought to death on the cross. Does that make sense? I don't want to just talk over you right now. This is really important. The idea that it has to die is what they're talking about here. The inner structure, whatever inner structure I built, has to come down. It's got to be brought to death on the cross. If I'm only working on the problem, 
I don't necessarily get to deconstruct the structure that's holding that thing so I can slip back into that old behavior pattern again, okay? A key to sanctification is to reach to the depths of the heart with the power of the cross and resurrection to effect lasting change. They say this in almost every chapter. Without this continual process of death and rebirth, the heart will remain unhealed, all right? It's not just fixing a problem. I'll go to this one. Corey Ten Boom said this in her book, The Tramp for the Lord, about forgiveness. She said, the message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us, right? Remember in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against. Mm. Conditional, all right? I knew it. Not only as a commandment of God, Corey Ten Boom said, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. She was one. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. God does not want any of us to remain invalids. And he's not saying you're weak because you're not completely healed. That's another guilt trip the enemy tries to put on you. You should be further along. You've been a Christian a long time. This isn't working for you. You're not a good Christian. Lie, lie, lie. Father of lies. All right? Don't believe him. So I'm just going to give you a quick, that's a one-pager that I gave you. You can read along if you want. This is says, uh, part of the testimony from Joyce Meyer. Because you got to know there's good news here, right? She lived through horrific, horrific abuse from her father. And you can go into this One Life video free on YouTube. You can find it. But this is the part near the end where she says, I'm happy to say that God gave me the grace to completely, 100% forgive my father. It took some time, but I was able to do it. I had forgiven him at one level, but I had not totally forgiven him. What class did we talk about that? Do you remember? Accomplishing forgiveness. And we said often we have forgiven people to one level. And she said it. I had done it at one level, but I hadn't totally forgiven him. I realized that when God asked me to move my parents close to our home to take care of them until they died. I thought, you have got to be kidding me. At first, I rebuked the thought. I said, there's no way this is God. No loving God would ask me to do that. See, so if you get a sick feeling when God asks you to be with the person that you've forgiven, you haven't completely forgiven them. So you're not supposed to get a sick feeling, right? They lived in a place where I only had to deal with them a couple of times a year. Just go by on the holidays, throw a little money at it, and try to keep it off my mind. God said, they're sick and they're old. I said, what did they ever do for me? All he said was, you're breathing. But then I had enough experience, I'm sorry, by then, I had enough experience to know when God was dealing with me. Uh, this is powerful. I also knew that God never tells us to do anything if it's not going to work out for our good. Why you need to know the voice of God and not get it confused with your own or somebody else's. So we bought my par parents, brought them to St. Louis to live, bought them a house, took most of our savings to do it. We'd send somebody over every week to get groceries and repair things in the house. Three years went by and there didn't seem to be much change in my dad. He went to church with us sometimes on holidays, but he was still just as mean as a snake. One Thanksgiving morning, my mother called and said, your dad would like you to come over. He wants to talk to you. She, mother said, I don't know what's wrong with him. He's been crying for about three weeks. You better come over. So Joyce and her husband went over, and the father looked at her and started crying. And he said, I just need to tell you how sorry I am for what I did to you. I've been wanting to say something for three years, but I just wasn't man enough. I didn't have the guts to do it. Then he says this, anyone else would have wanted to kill me, but you've never been anything but nice to me. 
meaning by moving me here, taking care of me for these three years, paying our bills for us. And that day, she says, my father received Christ that day. We baptized him 10 days later. And then he died about three years ago when this was, from when this was written. He was changed. He became a sweet old guy. Joyce Meyer says, I'd kiss him on the cheek and not even be afraid. That was a black eye for the devil. And then she said, look, you might be asking, where was God in all this? And that's a very legitimate question, right? So she said, let's talk about that for a minute. As a young girl, when she was still living home, she had prayed for her father to die. That didn't happen. Prayed for her mom to leave the father. That didn't happen. Prayed that the father would stop abusing her. That didn't happen. So then she said, why didn't God help me? Cindy alluded to the same idea. Like, where were you in all this, God? I was just a little innocent kid being sexually abused. And now Joyce is in the present saying, I don't have all the answers to that. God didn't get me out of it, but he did give me the strength to go through it. Okay? Sin is rampant in the world. That's not God's fault. That's man's fault. We suffer the consequences of it. He gives us the ability to get healed from it and to avoid it. She said, I remember when I was a teenager lying in bed at night praying, someday I'm going to do something great. You know, and when she said that, she's in a 20,000 seat auditorium, not an empty seat in the whole place. I mean, you know, to come out of that mess and for God to establish her with a worldwide ministry the way he has, it's just a miracle. And she says, look, I believe God, that God puts a seed of greatness in everyone. Satan tries to diminish us and demean us and belittle us through people mistreating us, but God has a plan. You believe that? Yes. God has a plan for me too. For years I said, I wish that I would have never been abused, and about three years ago God spoke to me and said, stop saying that. What Satan meant for harm, God worked out for the good. I'm stronger. I know God better. I understand people's pain. I believe it's made me able to reach out to you in your pain and your need, and to tell you with all passion that God is alive. He loves you, and he's got a good plan for your life. We just read that, Jeremiah 29, 11. Don't you ever doubt that? Don't you ever doubt that you can recover? And then she says to the crowd, you're looking at somebody who did recover. You're looking at the evidence that you can recover, and there's no place so deep that he can't reach down and lift you out. He'll set your feet on a rock and give you a wonderful life. Let's stand. So you could read the expanded version of this. I only took two verses because this is what Joyce Myers quotes, um, and I was giving you a transcript of her talk. But Isaiah 61 is what Cindy quoted earlier from Luke. When Jesus reads in Luke chapter 4, he's reading from Isaiah 61. And I'm sure a lot of you know this portion of scripture because it's talked about as the great exchange. Um, one song called it the beautiful exchange, beauty for ashes. Right? You know that one? Well, there's a lot of ashes when there's sexual abuse involved and there's this kind of trauma. So to think that God could give us beauty for that, we, we just it needs, it, we, we need faith for that, right? And like I said, maybe you, you didn't experience this personally, but when you get a burden for other people that have had, had experienced this kind of pain, it touches the heart of God. Because, you know, there's a saying in the world, the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good people, good men and women, to stand by and do nothing. <laughs> so if we're supposed to be healed healers, even if we didn't have this happen to us directly, we should have a heart for people that had it happen and help pull, up, pull them out of it, right? So whether it applies to you directly or not, I think it applies to all of us as ministers of reconciliation in the body of Christ. So let's read it out loud together. Can you see it from your seat? I don't think you have it in your handout, but you got it up there, right? Oh, I did put it on there. Good. Isaiah 61, verse 3. Ready? He will give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He will make you a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Instead of your shame, you shall have double... Say that again, please. Instead of your shame, you shall. Do me a favor. Turn to the camera in case somebody's watching right now and, and point to that camera and say, instead of your shame, 
you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, you shall rejoice in your portion. And then finish it with this. You shall possess double. And everlasting joy shall be yours. All right, now look, now look up this way. That's good news. I want to just put my own name in here, okay? So can we read it that way? God will give me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. He will give me a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He will make me a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that my life might glorify him. Instead of my shame, I shall have double honor. Instead of my confusion, I shall rejoice in my portion. Say it again. I shall rejoice in my portion. You know what? I do rejoice in my portion. I will possess double and everlasting joy will be mine in Jesus' name. So, Lord, I thank you for your people. Anybody, if even just one person saw this on the, on the Internet, that it blessed them, Lord. It was worth anything that we could do to help get a message of healing out to people. Lord, we thank you that you're not bound by time. You're not bound by distance or location. There's no pit too deep that you can't reach your arm down in and pull us out. There's nothing that's happened to anybody that you still won't come and meet us in that pain and pull us up out of that place. So we just ask you, Lord, right now to touch hearts, our hearts. Heal us if we went through this, but also just sensitize us if we have it to be able to speak to other people about it in a way that brings your oil into those difficult places of their life that need that bomb of Gilead to come. We pray that you would lift that burden off of people's lives, that shame and that guilt that they might be carrying, that sense of uncleanness. Like Cindy said when she took a shower, that word that you gave her, that, that you brought cleansing through that prophetic act that she did, Lord. We thank you that you're no respecter of persons. You love everybody the same. If you do it for one, you do it for anyone. And that none of us are too far away that you wouldn't help us in the situation that we're in. So we pray hope would go out. Go out from this place, Lord. We ask you, spread your hope through the nation. But also, in, in this place right here tonight, anyone who needs that healing, Lord, we ask you to meet them right where they're at tonight and bring your transformation power in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. And I think we do have some people to pray tonight. So um, if that's the situation that you're in and you'd like us to stand in agreement with you, uh, we're not going to run out. We'll be here. You all have an awesome night.